Welcome to another video where I mess around in Rio and try to teach you something. <laughs> so for today, I'm going to show you how to debug, how to solve your own problems with materials. Because in the past, I made tutorials and people are always like, hey, I did everything you did, but this doesn't work. Or, or it looks wrong or something like that, you know? And it could be because Unreal changed something or because you followed it wrong or, or I cheated and I changed what I did in the middle of the video. But well, anyways, I want to teach you how to solve your own problems because that's key for you developing your own stuff from scratch. And if you've ever tried to debug materials in Unreal, you probably noticed that there's no print string nodes, there's no breakpoints, all those things that are really nice in blueprints to help you, they don't exist in materials. So how do you deal with that? I'm going to show you ways to deal with that. And if you stay until the end, I'm going to show you how to fix this spiral effect. So let's get to the intro because this is a long video that deserves it. And then we can start. The first tip is to make it faster to preview the nodes you're working with, to preview their results individually. Unreal has this option when you right click a node and you can click start previewing node. That will make you see only the node's result on the viewport here. But if every time you have to right click start and stop previewing node, that's going to pile up and it's going to consume a lot of time. So to make it faster, you can add a shortcut for, for that. So let's go to Edit, Editor Preferences. And then you look for Start Preview. And a shortcut, I believe, is not used by anything else in the engine, or if it is, I don't miss it, is P. So set P. You can close this now. Now when you select a node, if you just push P on your keyboard, you're going to see that it toggles on and off. Another thing you can do to speed up your life when you are previewing nodes and working with animated effects like this is to enable real-time real -time preview on the nodes. So for instance, I have the sign here, which is generating all these circles. And it's not moving like it is on the preview here. And sometimes, what you have on the preview here is the result of many other things added together, and you need to see all the steps, what's happening from node to node, but in real time with the animations. So to do that, you can come here to live update, real time nodes. Now this node's updated with it, uh, with the animations that come before it. The problem though is if I, for instance, disconnect this, this wasn't updated but this is not the final result that it's generating. You can see here, it's blinking the, the whole material. So to fix that, you want to enable also all node previews. Now, every node in the graph is going to be updated whenever you make a change in real time. So this is how you can speed up your life a bit when you're working with many nodes and you can just preview specific nodes at certain points if P is not enough for you. Or if you don't want to preview one single node or something like that, it, it's useful. Another thing I want to mention is if your material is really complex, it can make it really heavy to keep reviewing all nodes. So just be aware of that. Like if you're making a change and it's taking forever to compile, I'll have tips for that later, but enabling all node previews can also be a culprit. Another thing to keep in mind when you're using the preview mode in the material nodes is you can only display RGB values. It's going to display all three of them or just two or just one, depending on how many values the thing you're previewing outputs. So for instance, the Fresnel node here, it is a node that outputs only a single value, so just a float. So you see the preview in black and white. The texture sample, actually, let me go to the texture cord first. So the texture cord is a node that outputs 
two floats because it has the horizontal and the vertical coordinate, the U and V. And when you have something like that, you're going to see the preview in red and green. And here it becomes yellow because here both values are one. So when you put together R, red and green as one, it becomes yellow. So every time you have two values, you're going to see them as red and green. First one is red, second is green. And the texture sample outputs by default three values. And this means you're going to see them as R, G, and B. But sometimes you also need to preview the alpha. And even if you set your material to translucent or something like that, the preview is not going to display the alpha channel. So what you can do to see individual channels is just add some math that doesn't make any changes to the nodes, like multiply by one. I like the multiply node because it's already one here. If I add, I can also connect it to the side that's not zero, so it's not going to change anything. And then you press P to preview that node. So here I can see that the red, and, and you're going to see because it's a single channel, it's going to be black and white, like the Fresnel node. And you're going to see the red is just a noise texture. Green is a checker texture. Blue is another checker texture. And alpha is like a grid. So that's how you can see multiple channels. If you connect something that, that's already multiple channels, it goes back to RGB mode. But as you can see, RGB8 doesn't display the alpha. Otherwise, the grid here that we saw on the alpha channel would be transparent. Now that you know how to preview things faster in the material, uh, let's say you have a problem to solve. You need to figure something out, but you didn't create the material or you created it, uh, created it a while ago and you don't remember anymore exactly how everything works. So you need to figure out where the problem's coming from. And a good process to do that is start previewing things along the whole chain from where you can see the problem all the way back to how that result gets generated. So here, the problem I want to I wanna debug is I have these two colors, pink or magenta and cyan, and I want my result here to change color depending on the distance from the camera. So it becomes pink, and if I go back, it becomes cyan, but also it's becoming green. And I don't want it to become green. I just want it to stop at cyan. So for some reason, it's becoming green. And this is coming from the emissive color. That's the, the color of my material. So I'm going to have to see all the way back through this chain that starts at the emissive color material where things are going wrong. So let's see. I preview this lerp here. This is becoming green. Let's see if the multiply has this problem. Otherwise, it could be a problem with the lerp. The multiply is also becoming green. So the problem is not the lerp. It could be the multiply itself or something before that. So let's see the lerp here. And pink and green. So it could be this lerp. Now, these two colors, I know that they're just colors. They don't, they don't change with distance. So it can't be, the, the culprit cannot be either of them. Maybe it's this, maybe it's the lerp node or this function here. And let's see, so I this is controlling the alpha for my LERP here. And it looks like the problem could be it because, I mean, I already know what the problem is, but if you notice, it becomes not just white, it starts glowing the further you go from the camera. So this indicates to me that maybe this value is not stopping at one and it's trying to interpolate beyond the cyan color here because the LERP nodes, they don't go just, they don't consider their alpha from just zero to one. If you pass negative values, they're going to try to go beyond the value that's inside A. So from cyan to pink and then from, to something beyond that. And if you pass values above one to them, they will interpolate from A to B and then beyond B. So it's that's what's happening here. But if I didn't know the LERP, the LERP works, works like that, or if I didn't know where the problem's coming from on the alpha, I can start previewing these colors. And previewing it just like this, like, oh, yeah, I see a glow here. That, that's kind of subjective sometimes. You can be more precise than that. So another tip is the debug nodes. So you have a bunch of them. You have debug binary values, flow two, three, four, scalar. I'm gonna use the scalar one here. 
because it's to debug a single float number, which is what this function outputs, because otherwise the preview here wouldn't be black and white. And I'm going to connect it to the debug node and press P to preview. So yeah, I can already see that the value is 1.8, 2, 3. The further I get, the higher it goes. And I just want it to go from 0 to 1, so it stops at the pink and stops at the cyan. Also, if I get closer, you can see that it starts becoming negative here. You see the minus sign, so my values are also going below 0. So the debug nodes are very useful. They're like, they're like material print string nodes that help you see what values are exactly. The other debug nodes are very useful for when you have multiple values at the same time, like uh, color. So you can do debug uh, float three in this case. I just want to see RGB. And then if you preview, it's going to give you the value of that color. So I know that this pink color is one on red and it's color and it, it, it colorizes the text by the channel that it's displaying the value from, which is really nice. So I know that red is one, green is zero and blue is one. So now that I know that the problem is coming from this MF underscore distance lerp function, I should go into the function and keep searching for where the problem is coming exactly from. So you can double click. So every time you see these bluish nodes, you can double click them to go into the source. Now, this function is one that I created, so it's part of my project and I can change it. But sometimes be careful because you may be altering engine functions. And if you do that, you're going to be changing that function to every project that uses it. So instead of modifying those, make copies of them into your project, then modify those copies and use those copies instead. Never modify something from the engine folder. How do you know if the function belongs to the engine? After you open the function, you click the browse button here, and it's going to show you on the content browser where the function is. It's going to highlight it for you. And if you see that it's inside the content folder, that's fine. It's yours. It's part of your project. You can change it without, probably without consequences, unless there's other things in your project using it as well. So be careful. But if it opens in the engine folder, so if it opens inside here, let me find you a function that's going to do that. Let's say spiral blur texture. So this is a function. If I double click, I have this. I could start changing this. But if you browse, you're going to see that it's inside the engine folder here, which is dangerous. Don't change these nodes. It's going to change them for every project you have that is or will ever use them with this engine version. Now, going back to our own function, we know that the problem is coming from here somewhere in this function because when we were testing in our material, doing step by step, we saw that printing the values from this node, it was going above one and below zero, which is not what we want for this LERP node. So let's go into function and see what's going on. First things first, sometimes you're going to be testing stuff in your function and you're going to see that nothing changes. So I know the distance should change something here, should make this cube go white, but nothing's happening. So let's start previewing these values. So I'm going to go from divide, debug scalar values, and I'm going to preview this, this node. One important note here, so first you can see that this, these values look very weird. This doesn't make sense. These are not ones. They're just, I don't know, pipes or something. Um, so this is not working. Another thing is, if you start previewing stuff inside a function and you stop, different from the previewing things in materials where when you preview a node and then when you stop, it goes back to previewing the material. In functions, you go back to previewing nothing. So everything you have here is just going to be black. like. It's just zero. So you have to turn on preview on your output result again. So you can go back to seeing the function results. But in this case, the function is giving that weird value that we saw. So let's preview it. And why is that? This usually means invalid float values. And invalid float values can happen for many reasons. One of the most usual ones being an infinite or a not a number value, not a number value. It's something that can happen in code when you try to do math that just doesn't exist. It's possible. In this case, I have this input here and these two inputs, which are float values. And 
I am subtracting one by the other and then dividing. So if looking from the out, at the output from the divide node, I have this weird result. Looking from the output from subtract, it says zero. So it's still something still looking good. However, you can't divide by zero. So it doesn't even matter what this subtract here is doing. This division is dividing by zero that's coming from here. And division by zero is impossible, so it becomes an invalid float. It becomes not a number, an n a n, you're going to see sometimes. So we need to fix that in order to preview our function here and figure out how to fix the problem that's happening in our material. And in order to do that, I need to set these preview values here from the inputs to something else. There are two ways to do that. One is change the preview value. And then you can see what's going on. The other way is to connect a node into the preview node here, the preview input here. I'm just going to change the value. It's going to be 100 here. Actually, let's do the same values that we had over here, 200 and 300. So I'm going to go back here. This one's going to be 300, my end. And start's going to be 100. All right, so now I can see that subtract has a non-zero value. So divide should be working. Let's connect divide to our preview. Yes, divide is working. But we still have that out of range values that I don't want. I want 0 to 1. And to solve that, we can just clamp the value. But instead of using the clamp node, I'm going to use, because I just want to clamp between 0 and 1, there's a faster, a bit of a faster function that does that, which is saturate. It doesn't have anything to do with saturating colors. It's a stupid name. <laughs> it's probably something from math. I don't know. But what it does is it just clamps values between 0 and 1. So I'm going to connect this to our output and also to our debug value. And now, well, float points always have a precision problem. So you're always going to have something, not always, but many times you're going to have like either 0 0.999999 or this. But the thing is, this is clamped. It's not going above 1 and it's not becoming negative below 0 anymore. All right, so this should be working. I can delete this. And if I want to go back to this function, I should preview the output result, which we can see it's not glowing anymore like it was before. So it doesn't go above one. I can close it. Actually, let me apply, save, save applies. And then here, I don't have the green problem anymore. My color stops at cyan, which is what I wanted. The other tip that's not just, not exactly related to debugging, but it helps debugging. If you work on a team, you're going to love people that do it, and people are going to love you for doing it. Comment your stuff. For instance, here, I have commented all the steps, so I know what each of these should do. Maybe they're not doing what they should do. Maybe they have a problem or something is calculated wrong, but at least the intention is commented. So when testing, when debugging these, I can just go through these nodes and go like, okay, so this says the it, it means the UV coordinate distance from the point that's zero. And this one says that it does some math to put zero in the center. So if I preview this, I can see that the coordinates from left to right seem to have zero at the center here and vertically as well. And then if I preview the distance, it is a point that's black in the middle and it becomes white going out towards from that point which means this is probably working. This is probably calculating the distance from that center point. So comment, always comment your stuff. You can either just hover over a node, uh, let's see one that doesn't have a comment, and click this small balloon here, this small bubble that shows up. You click it, and then you can add your comment. You can click it to hide without deleting the comment, but that's kind of useless. And you can pin it, so when you zoom out, it stays that size. It's useful for things that are like, this is very important and you should see it even if you're zoomed out because you, I don't know, you need to find it fast. The other comment node you can add is you circle, you select things you want to comment and you press C on your keyboard and then it adds a comment node for you. The comment node is nice because you can change the font size. You can go insane. You can change the color of it so you can, I don't know, you could color code your stuff like red for things that are broken and are pending a fix. 
or red for things that are important, or you just like making everything colorful. Uh, maybe it helps you figure out later what what is what. Like I have, uh, you could have a material which a bunch of with a bunch of different sections that do a, many different things all to be put together at the end here on the right, and you circle those sections with things like. Uh, this defines the position. This defines the reflection effect. This defines the normal maps and things like that. So always comment. It's very useful. Now here I added my debug scalar value back to my distance lerp node because I want to show you a problem that you're going to face many times. Sometimes you have meshes with very complex UV mapping or they're just not unwrapped correctly because they don't care about UVs at all, but you need to debug values in them. And these debug nodes, they use the mesh mapping by default, which means for meshes with complex mapping or without a mapping, it's unhelpful. You can't see the values or they're just scrambled weirdly in the mesh like this. So this is not a mesh with a bad UV mapping, by the way, Epic did a great job with these. <laughs> the problem is the number is in a very terrible place for me to see what's going on here. Like I can't even see the one. I know that this is printing one, but the one is hidden somewhere outside the UV here, so I can't see the whole value. How do you deal with this? Well, you can screen map the UVs. So instead of relying on the mesh, you rely on just the screen. You overlay the numbers on the mesh. And to do that, to do screen mapping in Unreal, you just need the screen coordinates, uh, which is the screen position node. And then you use the viewport UV. Unfortunately, these debug nodes, they accept UVs as input. So you use the viewport UV and voila, but it's huge. And you're probably not going to find this helpful yet. So we need to shrink these coordinates to see more of this, this number. And if you're familiar with manipulating coordinates, uh, or if you're not, you're, you're going to learn it now. You can make coordinates smaller and repeat by multiplying them. So I'm going to get these coordinates here. I'm just drag things. Uh, actually, let me copy these because that's all I need for now. All right, so I am going to multiply these coordinates by, let's say, 10. So we're going to have them repeating 10 times in the viewport. That should make our, that should make our numbers small enough that we can see. So I put it here, preview this node, and well, my number's not there. So what's going on? If I move this guy around, it's kind of hidden behind the menus here, but the numbers are showing up behind, right here at the top. The problem with setting UVs in these nodes is that they clamp the coordinates. So if I preview the screen position coordinates, you're going to see that it's black at the top left corner here, so values are 0, 0, and then it's yellow at the bottom right corner, where values are 1 and 1. And then at the top here, it's red because it's the maximum of x, and here's the maximum of y, so it's green. And so you can see this transition. That's how the UVs work on the viewport. And then if I multiply this, it becomes just like greater values. So it's not just going from zero to one anymore. It's going from zero at this corner all the way to 10 and 10, X10 and Y10 at this corner here. But because the debug scalar value, the debug nodes clamp the values between zero and one, you can't see anything beyond one. So you just see the corner here. To fix that, you can use the frac node. What the frac node does, if I preview, it converts any value to only its decimal part. That means if you have values that are like 100 million 0.5, you're only going to see 0 0.5 because 0 0.5 is the decimal part of it. So effectively, you can only see values from 0 to 0 0.9999999 and so on. So anything that you have that's greater than 0 to 1 becomes this repeating gradient. And this also means that the debug scalar value node, if I connect this frac result into it, now it's seeing that coordinate repeated all over from 0 to 1, from 0 to 1, from 0 to 1. And uh, now I realize the 10 is too small, so let's make maybe use 5. 5 looks kind of good, maybe 3. Okay, 3 is good. 
So now, as I move, I can actually see those numbers. If I position my mesh around the screen, I can actually, I'm capable to figure out what those numbers are trying to tell me. I know that at this distance, it's one and it stops at one. And if I get closer, it's zero and then it stops at zero. So that's a way to, to be able to view values from your material, like a print string, even when your mesh UVs are not helpful for that. Since we're talking about the frac node, I want to show you another very useful trick you can deal with it for debugging stuff. I am using absolute world position here. I'm going to use it for some effects. Let's say you want to use it. You need its value. And if you try to preview it to see what's going on, like uh, how, how far are the values going along your mesh or something like that, it becomes a problem because the world position node outputs uh, the centimeters at, of this pixel in the world, like where it is in the world. So at this point here, it's a very high value along Z, X, and Y. But I can't see that. So let's try debugging, using the debug nodes to see the values that these are trying to, that these mean. I'm going to preview the debug flow three. And you're going to see that the numbers look really weird. Apart from some zeros here that are fine, uh, it's not useful. And these are not because of what we saw before in the function. These are not like broken float values or anything. It's just because when you use debug value nodes, they display the value at that pixel. And because the world position changes constantly from pixel to pixel, like this pixel here where my pointer is, it doesn't have the, the same position as this pixel here to the right. They're different. So each pixel here is trying to, to display a different number, a different value. So that's confusing. You can't see that at all. One trick that you can do to work around that is instead of using the debug float three values, is just use the frac node and preview it to break apart the values. Now, because these values change really quickly, like from zero to one in probably less than a pixel, the frac is not yet, yet useful. You need to reduce the range of values that are going into it. And in order to do that, you can divide your high values by something. And you can also make that something useful. So if I divide my world position by 10 and preview with frac, what I'm seeing here is one of these gradient squares every 10 centimeters or unreal units because unreal units are just centimeters. So every 10 centimeters, I am seeing one of these gradients because I have the position of the, the pixels going from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20. And if you divide those values by 10, so 20 by 10 is 2. 10 by 10 is 1. From 1 to 2, the frac node is going to convert the values into just displaying the decimals between one and two. So you get these, these nice squares here. And it can be very useful if you want to know the size of something. Like with 10, it's going to take a, going to take a while for me to count this. Let's try with 50, for instance. So I know that from the center to the edge of this cube, I have 50 plus 50 plus something. Maybe half, looks like half. But I know that it's at least 100 something. And let's guess that it's half. So let's divide this by 25 instead. Well, it's not exactly half, but it's close. So I'm not going to figure out the exact size of the cube this way, but you can use this frag technique to break apart many big values so you can actually see how they're progress throughout the mesh without it becoming it becoming super glowy or displaying trying to display super high values that you just can't display. Um, doing uh, this technique is also very useful when you're creating post processes or effects that use depth. Oh, pixel depth, I think it's the name. Pixel, yes, pixel depth. So this is the distance of the pixel from the camera, and if I use this trick, I can see that I create bending every 25 unreal units from the camera. So it helps me to have an idea of like, oh, okay, so looking at it uh, from this angle, I get a lot of distance. But 
when I'm looking at it like this, almost facing it, I, I'm i having like a transition from something that becomes zero here and then it becomes one. It's going to go towards zero again, but I can see the bending. So I can have an idea of like how fast values are progressing here. Know that this is every 25 real units. So using division and frac together is a very useful way to have an idea of how values are progressing throughout your mesh or an effect or something like that. Now, going back to trying to see the size of the cube with this debug node here, with the cube, we are lucky because it has very straight faces that are going to be in a single position on each axis. So for instance, this face, the whole face is in the same X position of the world. So I know that this face is at 1 minus 128. This other face is all in a, sing in a single Y position in the world. So I know that it's roughly 128, 127 it looks. And then the top one is aligned with Z. But sometimes you're not that lucky. Maybe you have a sphere. And then first the mapping is horrible. Like it's just impossible for you to read something here. And second, you are seeing a ma many different values in each pixel here. So it's, it's just fully unreadable. First, we can try to use that trick of having UVs either because I know the sphere has useful UVs around it. So if you preview the UV coordinates with the sphere, it has nice coordinates that circle around the sphere. So because I know that, I'm not going to do the screen mapping thing to see the values. I'm just going to multiply these coordinates to see the numbers becoming smaller on the sphere. So I'm going to multiply this by maybe 5. And then put it into the UVs and preview the debug and then we have that problem where it clamps the values i also know the values are too small so let's do divided by three perhaps yeah that's better but i need the frac node in order to work around the problem of the debug node clamping the coordinates all right so now i can see i can see the values a bit better but it's still around the circular area position of each pixel changes a bit like the numbers change a bit for each pixel and we can't read it. How do you work around that? Well, you make the gradient not a gradient. I thought this is driving me nuts. All right. So you make the gradient not a gradient. So for now, what you're trying to preview, uh, actually, let's go to the position here. Even if I put it through divide and frac like we did before, it's going to be a bunch of gradients or smaller gradients, and the numbers are never going to be uniform along a, a certain area. So you can break that gradient apart. Think of it as pixelating. So to pixelate the world position gradient, first, I'm going to make, because it's, it's values progressing like really fast, I'm going to make them progress a little slower. So I'm going to divide them, or I could multiply by a very low value, but Dividing is going to be easier for a reason you're going to see. Um, let's say I want to see a single value every 10 centimeters. So it's going to be like 10 centimeter big pixels instead of this gradient going around the sphere. And then after dividing, I am going to floor. Floor rounds numbers down. So let's say I was, uh, so a value is coming from here as five centimeters, five real units. I'm going to see centimeters because that's how I, I think anyway. It's, it's easier for me. So it comes as 5 centimeters. Then you divide by 10, it becomes 0 0.5. And when you round it down, it becomes 0. And then let's say you have on another pixel a value that is 15. If you divide 15 by 10, it becomes 1.5. And 1.5 rounded down becomes 1. So effectively, you're going to have 10 centimeters of pixels displaying as 0. And then 10 centimeters of pixels displaying at 1 and then a two and so on. But for now, I just made the values lower. I floored them, so you already have some bending here. But the problem is if I just keep this and use this, these are not the original values because remember, th these are not close to the original values because I divided them by 10. So anything that's like 100, it's gonna display just 10. I need it to be bigger. So I put it back to its normal size by multiplying it. And because we eliminated all those decimal values in between every 10 centimeters, we're going to see the original values bended every 10 centimeters. Now, 10 is a bit... Oh, actually, I didn't multiply here. 10. 
but still 10 it's bending it's kind of hard to see because of the glowing effect uh maybe a one two actually i don't care about it glowing because what matters is that i can now see these and if i make this numbers smaller even let's say five maybe ten and make the pixels bigger because i feel like these are two small bends to see a single number throughout them uh let's say here hold one and click to create a value because these use the same number it's faster if i do this because i can just change the number through here now let's say i want to see a single value every 50 centimeters every 30 centimeters so i have bigger bending here and then if i preview I have better values. These are probably broken, like in between them, they're changing values somewhere. But you can better see the numbers because you have a single value going through the sphere every 30 centimeters. So it's not like a gradient of pixels of different values everywhere trying to display a different number. Same thing if I review it as a cube. Now, the cube, this is going to look much better because the pixelation just matches the cube, the pixelation of world position. The thing, though, is these numbers are really small and this is starting to bother me. So let me show you a trick to make them bigger. Besides the EVs that you have on the debug for three values that you can manipulate, it, you can also give it the area of rendering for the numbers. Like how far they are. Imagine they are being drawn inside a grid and you can define how close they are to the borders of that grid. These two inputs on the debug nodes, the debug text location and the component spacing are what define how these numbers are drawn inside this grid that we are creating by multiplying the UVs. Like how much space they use in their zero to one coordinate space. The first one is the margins, the distance from the numbers to the borders of that invisible grid. And to control them, as you can see, they have a default value of 0 0.30, 0 0.30, 0 0.70, 0 0.70. And these mean left corner, top corner, uh, actually, sorry, left margin, top margin, bottom margin, and right margin from zero to one. So zero would be all the way to the left or the top, and one is all the way to the bottom or the right. And to manipulate them, we are gonna create a four, a float four value, because we need the four numbers, as it says here, V4, which means this is a float four number. And then we're gonna change these values. Let's try and make them use the whole area. So for the left, I'm gonna have zero. For the top, I'm gonna have zero. And then it becomes, right and bottom the right i want it to go all the way to the border so one and same thing with the bottom then if i connect this back uh back no if i connect this to the debug text location you're gonna see that the numbers are using almost all of their square area of the, the, the of all, almost all of the square they they can each occupy they're still not using all of it because the second parameter here the component spacing defines how much each of these texts are going to use of the space they have available to them. And these also have a margin by default. So if we look here, by default, on left, it has zero margin. On the top, it's 35%. To the right, it goes all the way to the right, one, so 100%. And to the bottom, it only goes 65%. Let's set those to the same margins we did for the, the whole group of numbers. So it's going to try to occupy as much space as it can. So as you can see, the numbers are as big as they can be. They're touching each other, so it means they're occupying all the space available for them. I mean, this is very useful because you can see them from further. You can see, you, you can multiply them by even smaller values, like you can multiply the coordinates by even smaller values and still be able to read the numbers at least a bit, depending on the distance. Um, so yeah, this is another way to make these numbers easier to, to read, depending on, on where they are and how you are mapping them. Another useful tip with the debug nodes is you don't have to always, like with float three, you don't have to just pass colors to it. You can pass whatever group of three numbers that you want to them. 
So for instance, let's see debug float four, which is the one that accepts the most numbers. And then what I could pass to it is the RGB for my world position. And then I can append vector. And I could also pass to it the pixel depth or the actor. Let's try the actor position. Oops, uh, the actual position minus. I don't need the minus actually. Let's get the camera position. I want to know the distance from the actor to the camera position because that's a single number. Distance. I just I just want to show you like composing numbers. And then you put these together. You have the distance, which is a single number. You append it and you pass it to the vector four. And then if you preview this node, you have the four numbers there. So you have the position of this face on the cube. And you also have the distance from the cube to the camera on the fourth value there. And you could display like any four values. The append node is a very nice node because the way it composes things is it knows how many numbers each of the inputs you pass to it have. So if I wanted to compose, um, let's say, this is a, a, a texture coordinate, so it's a float two, it outputs, if we see here, it's just red and green, so it outputs two numbers. So if we append this, append vector, if we append this, we can append the distance from the camera, which is gonna look so ugly, but okay. <laughs> Now, we, this is a float three value because we had two from here and another one from here, and the maximum is four. So I could still add something else, like some, some other value to this node. Uh, like I can append again. So this is a float three, and I can append something else. Let's just append time to it. Time is simple. So I can append time. And if I display and preview the correct node, I am displaying time plus distance from the camera and the UVs. The UVs are scrambled because of that each pixel represents a different number. I would have to pixelate it, but you get the idea. You can display a bunch of numbers with these and the nice thing is they are color coded so you know what they are. If you don't want the color coded version for some reason, you can see that the debug float for values or any of these debug nodes, they have two outputs, the color coded one and the grayscale output. This is one thing about the about previewing nodes. When you preview them, uh, nodes with multiple outputs, you only preview the first output. So we can use the multiplying trick that I showed before to preview the other outputs. So this is the same thing, but just black and white, black for the background and white for the numbers. Now, let's say I'm working on a material that for some reason, when I move it around, something breaks like this. I, I had horrible problems, but they're complex. <laughs> so I tried to create a very simple one. And let's say this is undesired, the way it's changing here. But I need to figure out why it's changing here. And here is not the same as the preview here. So I can't just, let me preview this instead. Wait, uh, turn this off. So I can't just like try to figure out what the problem is here. I have to do it in the world. But if I want to see the debug values here, I have to create the debug node and connect it to my output. So my base color there. I save it. And now, cool, I can see the numbers. And maybe these not a number values here are indicating a problem, but sometimes it's not as obvious as that. And okay, something's happening, but I don't see the colors anymore. So how do I know if the problem, when the problem is happening? Maybe it's from rotating the mesh or something like that. So what you can do is compose the numbers on top of the mesh to debug on the level. And to do that, you have a few ways. The two ones that I prefer are, you can either add or subtract them from the standard colors. So if I add, it's gonna add those numbers to my standard colors, 
and then I can connect this to the base color. Let's see. So now I see the numbers on top of my color, and I know that the change is happening at some point here. The problem is with the base color, it's kind of hard to see uh, values above, above one. So using it on the base color is not very helpful. Let's try setting our color back to the base color. By the way, you don't have to always like go from here to here. You have a few options to connect things that are far apart. One of them is I can right click an output pin and tell Unreal to connect it to the emissive color, for instance. So oh, actually I want to connect this one to the emissive color. I don't care about the ad anymore. So now my debug values are an emissive in the material. So they are lit by themselves. That makes them pretty much always visible. So now I know that the material changes color when it goes from these weird values to negative. So maybe I want to change my math to fix that. But now I can see what's going on. And this was, I said, I had two favorite ways to preview these things. The other one, because sometimes even the emissive is not super helpful because you're already using the emissive for something else and adding doesn't help. You can lerp. You can compose things by lerping. Imagine lerp works as like layers on Photoshop, or if you have ever used anything with layers, that layers can have transparency and be on top of something else and still display that's that other something behind them. This is something you can do with LERP. The trick to do this is you need a uh, transparency and then A is going to be your bottom layer. So this is going to be my color and B is going to be my top layer, which is my debug numbers. And then for the opacity, you can use that black and white visualiz visualization of the numbers that I showed before because a mask is just that, black and white values. And that's pretty much what Epic caves is here with this grayscale output. White is numbers, so it's a mask for the numbers. Then we can put this in the base color. Let me remove the emissive so we don't think we are seeing it just because of those. And then I feel like for some reason this is still not working because I'm only seeing red here. At least composing can help in most situations. And sometimes you can use LERP to compose multiple debug values. Like you can, you have something else that you are debugging together. You have multiple of these. You can use, you can manipulate the UVs to offset them, offset their numbers to like a different position so they don't overlap. And then you can get the result from the previous one. So always think of A as the previous layer. Add it with, the, with B from the new layer and the opacity from the new layer going to the LERP node. This did nothing, so I don't need it. So that's how you can layer things on top of each other and use that in your favor when debugging. For this next tip, I have this problem here. I removed the opacity from my material, so you can just see how the colors would be if they weren't transparent. And this is not what I want it to look like. So my colors are being defined by this LERP node. So if I preview it, see that that's where my colors are coming from and it has that effect where if I get closer let me just change the camera FOV back to 90 so if I get closer it becomes pink and then cyan but I have these black waves in between you know, these black bands in between the actual colorful bands and this is a bug in my material because I did not say anywhere that it should become black. There's no black here. The only place where I'm changing the intensity of these colors are here, is here, when I have the color intensity. So whatever color it is, it's not gonna become black, it's just gonna become darker. So this is my standard color. You can just see close and far. And this is my darkened color. So if I switch back and forth between the two of them, you can see it's just a bit darker. So how does the LERP makes it black. We talked about the LERP having the problem of it doesn't clamp the values between zero and one by itself. And sometimes that can be a problem. Sometimes you want that. But in this case, 
that is a problem. And if that's happening, it's happening from the alpha. But if you look at the sign node, it, it just values from, let's preview it. It is just black and white values, right? So wh what's going on here? Well, from the debugging that we did before with the camera distance stuff, you probably know already that we might have negative colors in the bands here. But how can we confirm if we have negative colors? We've already looked at how to debug, um, how to print the values of things, but these pixels are changing value constantly, so that's not going to be helpful. We're going to see like a bunch of scrambled digits. We've looked at using freq. That will probably not help because these values don't look like they're going above zero or two above, uh, I mean, sorry, two above one or something like that, like huge values that we would use frac to break them apart and see how, how big they are. So for the negative values, if you want to confirm if they exist, you can pass a node through absolute. And absolute converts anything to positive. So if you have one, it stays as one. If you have minus one, it becomes one. Anything that's negative, it just removes the negative sign and it becomes positive. So what I can see here is that my bands were actually, so if I go back to how it was before, to how it is with the absolute, I can see that the parts that were black, they have waves of, the, of their own. So this is probably meaning that I have values going from one to maybe minus one because they look as intense as the positive ones. So using absolute, is a way for you to see if there are negative values going into your other nodes. But this doesn't solve the problem for us here. It doesn't like really confirm what's going on. It just gives us a tip, a hint of where to keep looking. So if we think about what's going on here, is the negative colors being passed to lerp, which we're assuming are minus one to one. And, and if you think about how sign works, if you read the whole text when you hover over it and hold Control and Alt, you're gonna see that the, it, it outputs values from minus one to one. It is a curve from minus one to one. So it means that we actually do have minus one going into our LERP. So the solution here is very simple. We just saturate like we did before with the distance thing. So if we saturate, our color only goes to the dark value that we set it up to go, like half intensity of the original color. But why was it going to black? I, ju I just want you to know that w how this happens. So what LERP is, is doing is, uh, let me see if I can really remember the math here. I'm gonna pause and just show you when it's done. So the small graph here is the math that's done in the LERP node. You have the A, B, and alpha inputs like we have here on this LERP node. And what it does is it adds to A the distance from A to B, so B minus A, multiplied by our alpha. So if that distance is 1, it's going to add the difference from B to A, all that difference into A, which means it's going to become B because the difference, adding the difference between them to the initial value makes it the final value. Consider A the initial value and B the final value. If you do, so here my example is A is one, B is five. Oops, I went into 0 0.5 and alpha is zero. If I set alpha to one, now his, this is a half gray, uh, half gray material, a half gray preview because I'm going out with alpha one all the way to B. If my alpha goes to zero, I go back to A, which is one. But if my alpha goes beyond one, it's gonna go beyond 0 0.5. So if my alpha is two, it goes black because the distance from A to B is 0 0.5. It's going down 0 0.5. If I double that distance, it's going down one instead of just 0 0.5. So from one, it goes all the way to zero. And this is similar to what's happening with the colors. With the colors, I have 0 0.5 intensity on A, then the color on B. And because of my sign node, sometimes I'm passing minus one to it. 
And then it's going from 0.5, uh, sorry, it's going inverse way because it's negative. So it's going from one to 0.5, that would be zero. But then I'm doubling that distance, going to minus one. So instead of just going to 0.5, it goes to zero. That's why the color was becoming black because I was going from full color, so full color here on B, to half color here on A, but I was doubling that distance from full to half. So it was going from full to zero because there was minus one coming from here. Now, sometimes you're using the preview nodes, the preview functionality to just see what you're doing step by step as you develop a material. Let's say you're not debugging something that's already there. You're developing the material and you haven't connected stuff yet to the output node. And then you make some mistake, like trying to multiply a float two, let's say like the UV coordinates, by a float three, which would be the colors here. So if I multiply these, I am previewing this node. This node has an error, but Unreal won't tell me what the error is. You see stats here, just fine, like nothing's wrong. And that's because it only displays errors from things that are connected into the output node of the material. So you have to connect your erroring nodes some part of that chain needs to be connected to the output node, either directly or through something else. And then Unreal is going to tell you what the problem is. So just be aware of that. When you're previewing and your nodes are not connected to the output, even if there is an error, you're not going to see what the error is until you connect it to the output. So knowing that can be useful to figure out faster what you need to fix on your material. Speaking of connecting things to the output node, Sometimes you are developing a material or a new part on a material that's already huge. There's lots of nodes spread all around. And hopefully you are using renamed, uh, named reroute nodes. And they can be very useful for when you are debugging stuff and you need to connect the output node to see errors like we just did on the previous tip. And the way you can do that is you can, is you can have a single named reroute debug node like let's call it debug. And because named reroute nodes, they don't have a specified type until you connect something to them, to them, you can just keep them connected into an output of your material. And whenever something, something breaks, actually, oops, this is the input. Uh, you need to use it. Let's call it debug so I can get it from the named reroutes because once you create this input node, you get the output that you can use anywhere. Connect it to the output of your material. And whenever something breaks, let's assume like this part of the graph was like really far away from the output of the material here. And it would be a hassle to just connect from here to there. Even if you right click and say connect to base color, it would be a line going all the way through your graph, making a mess. Just connect it to the debug here. Let's see, let, let me just make the error that, that I had before. So I'm multiplying something that's invalid, no errors here, but when I connect it to the debug, because this goes into the output of the material, this is now displayed, uh, the error is now displayed for me to see what it is. So keep dragging this around with you whenever you are working somewhere on the graph. So you can quickly connect this to the output material and see what's going on. This next tip is another one that's very useful to make things faster when you have to keep making changes to a material or debug something. Just make the material unlit and if you can opaque as well so when you have a surface material with the default lit model like here you can make it unlit to reduce the amount of computations that unreal is making to compile to compile your material if it's if it's translucent also make it opaque or you can even go like the most simplest material type in unreal and choose user interface instead of surface. And then you can just connect something to the final color output of your material and it will just see an image here. This makes it much faster for Unreal to calculate your material because it's not compiling a version for uh, rendering shadows, a version for depth mapping. It, it, because any material you have in the surface domain with the lit model, the default lit model, it's going to compile a bunch of versions of the same material. So if the material is heavy, that's going to take a while. Sometimes the problem you have to solve is something that's happening so fast 
you can't really see what's going on, what's what or how it's going wrong. So a tip for that is to play your game. You have to do this while playing. So I'm going to play the game here. And then you can type the command, go here, open the command window with apostrophe on US keyboards by default. And then you can type slow-mo. And then one is normal time speed. Anything below one makes time go that slow, like 0 0.5 makes time flow at half the speed. And two or anything like greater than one makes time speed up in case it's something that takes a while before it happens and you need to test faster. That's also something you can do. So here I'm gonna do 0 0.5, hit enter. And now you can see the material is moving slowly. And this is just an effect I, that I could change the speed in the material myself. But sometimes it's something that happens when an object moves in your game or, you know, any effect that it happens fast. You can't really control it with in-game commands or, or, or interact, interactivity in the game or something like that. So slowing down time is a very helpful way sometimes to see what's going on and maybe exactly when it goes on. And to put it back to normal, you just have to type slow-mo one and enter. 0 0.5 is not the only one you can use. You can use any decimal value you want. You can go like 0 0.001 even, but it's gonna look like time stopped. I hope this can help you someday. For this one, I'm gonna use a post-process material. So I have this post-process here that selects it gets the custom stencil from Unreal. It's like custom depth, but you can set specific values instead of just the depth on the object. And I'm comparing it to one, and if it's one, it's gonna render this highlight here on top of that object. So I mask it with this if node, and then I add it to the post-process input, which is just the scene colors that were rendered before the post-process material. I'm not using preview here because preview sometimes breaks on, on post-process materials and gets stuck. So let's see, I can preview this here and I can preview this. It's not breaking for now, but it's, it's annoying. Sometimes you're previewing something, you make a change and it just stops changing what node you were previewing, like for now. So I, I just disabled preview. It was supposed to be back to black because this mask here is not seeing anything with, with stencil but it's not working. I believe the fix is it just reconnect, reconnects something. Uh, I don't remember if it can be anywhere. No, it didn't work. So maybe here and then here. No, no, not working. Apply, save. Yep, I think I'm gonna have to close this one and open it again. <laughs> yeah, it's really stuck. Maybe I can preview this and stop. No, all right. So I'm gonna close this. Yes, I wanna save it. So I have that post-process material. I'm gonna open it again later. I have that and I need to set it up on the scene. So let's add on um, visual effects, post-process volume. Now that I have a post-process volume in the scene, can I see it? It's hidden there. I need to set its bounds to infinite. So here, infinite extent so that I can see the post-process from it, even if the camera is outside of the volume. And uh, where is the post-process list? Here. So post-process materials array, I add one, choose the type to be asset. And then I pick my post-process EP, highlight, stencil highlight. And then to enable the, the stencil on the mesh, because not every mesh is gonna render stencil, you have to set it up. You select the mesh, you go to its rendering properties, scroll down, to render custom depth pass, enable it. And then you need to set the custom depth stencil value that, it, that you want it to render. So I'm gonna set it to render on one and custom depth stencil right mask. It's gonna be first bit. All right, so nothing changed. I was supposed to have a highlight here already. Let's check our material to see if everything is working. First, I wanna make sure that the material is actually affecting the scene. So I'm just gonna render red. Where, whenever this material is applied to the scene, it's just gonna be red. All right, so the material is there. I can confirm it because the scene just became red. So 
I know the material's there, so something's wrong with my logic here. Now, this is not something that if you don't know, you're gonna figure out easily. It's, and it's really annoying. When you use the if node on your comparison inputs, Unreal is gonna use only the amount of floats that you set on the first parameter. This is a node that only outputs one float, which means it's using only the first float from my color here, which is zero. So let me set it just so you see it. This is 0 0.5, then I'm gonna save. And now I have, I don't know if you can see it on the video on YouTube, but I have a weird glitched highlight going through the scene. It's not just on the box. So something's clearly wrong. And this is what I really wanted to show you. If you go to the top here on the lit menu and you go down to buffer visualization, you have lots of buffers here that you can see. Most of these are the ones you can use in post-process materials. So if something is unexpected, you can inspect these to be like, hey, what is the material seeing at all? You can also print it from the material directly. But for the sake of knowledge, I want to show you some of these. So first, the overview, which shows you an overview of many states of the G buffer, all the textures that Unreal renders before it becomes the final, the final render that you see here in the scene. But the depth stencil is not here. So let's get back to the buffer visualization modes and select custom stencil. Now, this is not what I expected. Completely not what I expected. It's all glitched. It looks like a, a GPU bug or something. So how do we fix that? And it is possible. The problem here is stencil is not enabled in Unreal by default. You have to enable it. And while you don't enable it, that's what it looks like. It's just glitch. To enable it, you go to Edit, Project Settings, look for Stencil, and then on Custom Depth Stencil Pass, it says Enabled, but actually you want Enabled with Stencil. Just Enabled is just the Custom Depth. So Enabled with Stencil, we can instantly see a change behind the window, so now our box is rendering the expected value of 1 because we set it to render 1 on the stencil. Now if I go back to the lit mode, we can see the highlight on top of our mesh. But the highlight is not the color I wanted because of that problem with the if node, so let's fix that too. So for now it's just getting 0 0.5 and adding it to the scene color, and when you pass just single float to a color, when you do math like that, it just uses that one float for all the channels in the color. So every channel is being added 0 0.5 to it. Now I'm gonna delete this and add an actual black color. So we have three channels being added with three channels. So it's gonna consider all the channels in our color here and the color is gonna look like what we expected. I'm gonna put this back to zero, save, go back to our level. And now I have my cyan highlight being added to the mesh color. So on this section, don't forget the main things. It's not just enabling stencil in Unreal. Remember you have buffer modes to debug what your post-process material is seeing. You can also pass what the post-process material re is receiving here from these scene texture nodes directly to the output. So you can also see what the material is seeing like that. And you also learned about the if node problem. This next tip is useful if you have to inspect intensities of colors or just values on the viewport here. Let me show you the distance here. So when I preview the distance, we see, and so it has a certain level of white, certain level of black. Now I'm gonna preview the multiply. You see what happened there? It was really bright for a while, but then Unreal kind of equalized it down. So auto exposure is always gonna be tr kind of tricking you. Now I changed back to distance, it was darker and it brightens a bit slowly because of auto exposure. You can disable that to see colors more precisely. If you go to lit at the top here, you can set the view to unlit. Now on unlit, I can actually see that there's like color bending here. So I know that this is where things become white, the values are becoming one, and they're probably going beyond one because I'm measuring distance here, so it just grows outwards. But 
I can I can see the band in here. So I know that this is where it becomes white. And if I preview the multiply node, you can see that it becomes white much earlier. So I know that these values are higher, higher than the than the one I was seeing before. And in real is not auto-balancing the exposure. So that's a way uh, for you to be able to visualize these things. You can also sometimes spot where uh, whether you have actual black values, because like if I preview this, you can see this are actually black pixels. They're not auto exposured to, I don't know, they could become grayish or something depending on the brightness of things around them. And I don't want that. So that's very useful for seeing kind of actual values without Unreal tricking you. I really like this next one. It's about how to visualize the transformations you're making to certain values, especially if they start as a linear progression. For instance, here, I start getting the distance from the center to the edges of the, of the UV coordinates. And distance is always something linear. So as a simulation, I have here just the red coordinate. Let me put this on unlit so we can actually see the difference we're going to make on the, on, the, on the values. So here we are measuring the distance from the left edge. That's pretty much what the U coordinate, if you filter with R using the component mask node, that's pretty much what you're getting with the cube. You're getting the distance from the left edge. So we have this distance. And if I preview with this MF curve graph, I made this function, so I'm going to teach you how to do it too, but just, just so you see how cool it is. For now, the range is at the default of minus 1 to 1, and my distance goes from 0 probably to 1, because it's in a UV coordinate and the cube is matched to 0 to 1. So let me change the range here. I'm going to make the range go from 0 to 1. It's a vector 2, so I have to make a vector 2. And now I can see that from left to right, the range goes from 0 to 1, the, the UV goes from 0 to 1 linearly. So it makes a straight line. Now, if I want to change the gradient's appearance, for instance, I want to make it a curve so it starts very with very low values and then increases fast. I can put it through a power node. So it multiplies by itself. And by 2, it already makes a nice curve, as you can see on the graph. And this is what just the gradient looks like. This is without the curve transform. This is with the curve transform. So you've darkened those initial values and then it goes all the way to bright. So previewing here the graph, you can see that if I change this to like 0.8, curve, it curves up. Let's make it drastic, 0.4. And then if I go back to previewing the visualization, like the gradient, you see that it go, it becomes bright really fast, and then it slowly gets to the maximum value. So like you almost can't see dark parts here on the left. That's with the power node. But for these spiral effects here that I have going on, I did some other stuff. I used sign, I used add with time to animate the, the lines, and I multiplied the initial distance by a greater value to multiply how many times my graph shows up. Let me show you like with the graph here because it's gonna be much easier to understand. So I have this, let's always preview this graph. So just linear, and then I'm gonna multiply it by let's say five and preview. So now you can see that it reaches one much faster, precisely at one fifth of the way, because now it's multiplied by five. So even the value here of 0 0.25 multiplied by five, is that it? No, 0 0.2, <laughs> 0 0.2 multiplied by five becomes one. And then if I increase the range from zero to five, you can see the whole graph again but this is now going up to five. So once I have that, I'm gonna put it through a sign node. Now the sign node is all the way at the bottom there, which means it probably has negative values and I think it's not going above one because if we look at the comment on the sign, it says it goes from minus one to one. So let's change our range here so we can visualize that from minus one to one. 
So now you can see five waves going up and down, and that's what sine does. It gets every single iteration, so if I multiply by just one, and create this shape. So that's how I'm transforming distance values. Let me show you the preview with the sine node. You see, it creates like this kind of wavy thing. If we multiply, it looks very wavy. If you if increase the number of times the graph repeats, and that's how sine works. You can insert really high values onto it, and it's just going to keep drawing waves between minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. It's really useful for animation. So that's what I did up here. I get the distance, which is a linear value from the center to the edges of the square. I multiply by higher value to get to make the graph repeat more times. I keep adding time to it, so it offsets those values. So if I do the same thing here, oops, not divide, add. If I do the same thing here and preview, it becomes black because I am multiplying time by a negative value. So it's making the values really negative. I'm not going to try to guess what's the range here because it goes further and further as time passes. I would have to use debug, the debug nodes to see what time actually is right now. But I don't care. I actually want to see what, what happens to sign. So when I start previewing the sign node, you'll see the same animation that we have with the kind of spirals here, the donuts. And if I go to the curve, you can see the curve matches the values that we are seeing. Now, how did I make this curve reviewer? Let's double click it. And here you can see, I also added the option to see two or three curves at the same time using the RGB values. But for just one, what you need is the range. So the range, I set it as a vector two, and I set it directly on the node to use the, the preview value as default for minus one to one. And then I break those two values, pass it into a linear interpolate. The linear interpolate is going to use the vertical mapping of, of the object that you have. So in this case, it's the cube. It uses the vertical mapping to convert values from 0 to 1 into max and min range. It's inverted here. I put the higher value after and the smaller value before on A because Y by default, if you preview, it starts dark at the top. And I want it to start dark at the bottom because I want the graph growing up. Because I don't know, that's that just feels more instinctive to look at. And then you need to be previewing something. And then I pass this lerp through a step node the step node returns 1 if y is higher than x. So that's how I'm generating this graph here. One problem that I can make this easier even is the value that goes into the graph from left to right has to be calculated on the material that's using it. But then I just send it to the output, and that's how you can see it in the material. And by appending other things doing similar math, I just put some... Preview math here, like power, constant bias scale, and sine, just to change the appearance of the other two curves for a nice preview. But those are controllable in the material where you use this function. So I hope you made good use of this graph preview node because it saved me a few times. I wanted to make sure that a curve was being drawn as I expected. I, was, I wanted to make sure that my math was correct. And that's how I did it. That's how I verified it. Another common problem you might encounter when you are developing your own materials or just debugging some existing one is you need to preview the material with a different metallic, a different roughness, and you don't want to reconnect everything to this node here on the right because maybe the material is super complex and you just don't want to go through it and then reconnect everything again after you're done testing. So what you can do is you can create a set material attributes node and the set material attributes node, it allows you to create inputs for any of the things you want to control in this material. So you can add base color, metallic, and after you add, you don't have to keep the one that comes here. So I can change the specular to roughness. And then I can set the outputs over here without changing the ones that are actually for my material. And I can just delete this afterwards. So for instance, here I want the sign to be my base color. I can start previewing this node. And you see it actually is lit if I turn on the lit option. Okay, now it's lit. 
So it's actually lit. I can prove it to you by setting roughness to zero so you can see that it's not reflective, which is beautiful. I love this. All right, so that's how you can preview, uh, preview a whole material without replacing everything that's going to your outputs. As a final tip, whenever you want to preview a texture on something, but your artists don't have the texture yet, or you want some texture that looks more technical, Unreal has you covered here. I'm going to create a texture, hold T and click. And then on the texture, I'm going to look for pattern. And Unreal has test pattern one and test pattern two. Test pattern two has a grid and numbers. So it's really nice, very useful. However, you might not see this. And if you don't, it's because you need to go here on this gear and enable show engine content. If you Because these, if you hover over them, you're going to see that their path starts with engine, engine slash functions, blah, 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 blah. And that means that it's inside the engine folder. And if it's there, you can only see it if you enable that show in the engine content option. Okay, so I'm gonna click this texture. Now, if I preview this on the cube, you can see it's a very useful texture. It has many colors, it has a grid, so you can see how many times you are repeating a texture if you're doing something like that, or if you're if you're writing functions to rotate textures. This is a very useful texture for testing so many things. I love it. And the good thing about it, one, another good thing, is it's not in the editor folder of the engine. Because things in the editor folder, they might be excluded from your project, and this will break the compilation of your material when cooking your project. So it being in the engine folder means it's always present in the cooked content of your project. So you can always use it for testing and leave it there in your material. It's not going to break your material. Hey, I wanted to include this bonus tip. If you made this far, I hope you like it. Well, I wanted to make an effect of a spiral on these donuts. So let me show you what I got. I connect this here, and then I get the spiral, but it has a cut here. To make it easier to preview, let me show you with less waves. So what's going on here, let me also make it slow or even stop, all right? So what's going on here is I get the distance from the center. I multiply by some value. Let's ignore it for now. So just the distance from the center. I'm not animating it anymore. So from, with the distance from the center, I'm adding to it the angle from the center of each pixel. The angle that it has from the center, from the pixel to the center, it has an angle. So let's say like here it's zero and then increases to 90 degrees and so on. I'm adding those values to the distance value. This creates the, the effect that I'm offsetting the donut in different ways all around the center. And that's how it becomes a spiral. But there's a problem. I have this line here. So if I enable animation again, you're gonna see that I have this cut. Now this will be really hard to debug because values there are changing all the time. And even if you stop it and you try to debug by seeing the values with text, it's different values in every pixel. So that's not going to help you a lot. One thing you can try is to visualize what's going on by previewing the angle computation. Let's turn unlit on so we can actually see when it becomes one or zero. Okay, so I see that there's like some bending here, which means it reaches one over here. And here it's zero. And if I put this node through an ABS node, I can also see that there are negative values here going to minus one and probably increasing even more. So if I, if I add a frac to this, so I can break up these values on every interval of one, we see that it goes to one and then two and then three and something. One way to fix this is to divide the angle because I want the value at the line here both on the negative and on the positive side to be either one or zero, because that will make the sine node generate the same wave, the same amount of waviness around this line. But we saw that around this, it's three point something. It's not, not one or zero, it's completely off that. So one thing that I can do 
whenever you have big values and you want to convert them to a range of zero to one, if they already start at zero, it's super easy, barely an inconvenience. You can just divide them by their max value. So I saw that the max was like three point something. Let's start with three and a half. And I need to preview it with this map. That didn't work well. Let's see if I overshot. Let's try 3.1. That's much closer. So it's either less. Let's try 3.08. I feel like that's worse. So let's try 3.15. Right. That fixed it. But this is a magical value. Magical values are like, use this value, otherwise it breaks. It means you don't really understand what's going on and it feels like a workaround. It's terrible because if someone changes anything here before this node, the values coming from here are going to change and it's going to break your magical value. You're going to have to figure out a new magical value. Now, this is where just debugging doesn't really get you to the, to the end point of it, of the problem. If you want to mess with materials, if you want to make very cool looking materials, study a bit of math, especially trigonometry. What these arc tangent nodes do when they figure out the angle from the X and Y coordinate of the pixel, when they figure out this angle, they return the angle in radians, not like zero to 90 to 180, it's not degrees, it's radians. And radians, a full circle is two pi. And fortunately, I don't have to know how much pi is, which is pretty close to 315 here. It's 3.14 something, something, something. But I don't have to know that by, by heart. I can just right click, look for pi, and then <laughs> look even more because it's never the first thing that gets selected, which is annoying. But once you, fi you find pi here, you select it. And then we know that a circle in radians is 2 pi. So pi has a multiplier here, which is very useful. I just have to pass 2 to it, so it becomes 2 pi, the output of this function. I connect it to my divide, and now I'm absolutely sure that the values at the edge here are matching. The 0 to 1 just probably becomes 0 here. Uh, let's actually preview the divide. So I can see that the values go from 0 to... This looks like 0 0.5. It's kind of dark, but it's because it goes from 0 to 3.14, so it goes from 0 to pi, and then 0 to negative pi. So I can actually divide by just pi. Oh yeah, now I can see that it goes from black all the way to white. So I'm, I have the full range here of 0 to 1, and if I put this through an absolute node, we'll see that the negative range is doing the same. So minus 1 here is exactly where 1 is on the other side, which means the sign, the waves generated by the sign node are going to loop perfectly. And this gives me this final result. And then I can just multiply, like I showed you with the graph preview before, I can multiply to generate more waves. I could change the speed of the animation. Uh, that's pretty much it. I'm really honored you stayed this far into the video. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed these tips. I hope they help you fix whatever material problems you have, especially with my tutorials. <laughs> this. I should have done this tutorial years ago when people started asking questions like, oh, I did everything you, you did in the video, but it didn't work for this and that. And they have to figure it out, but they don't know even where to start figuring it out. So I hope these tips help you find your way around your own problems or even problems that you find in tutorials. So that's it. Uh, if you are one of the few precious people that follow my channel closely, you're going to notice that I post videos like almost once a year. And well, it's because it's a lot of trouble for me to record these. I get really nervous. I don't want to make mistakes and I do them a lot. So please, if you like this content, just let me know by liking and perhaps even subscribing. I, I really hope I help you someday, even if not today. I hope one day you're going to be like, hey, I can fix this. I learned this from Rod. That's going to be great. Thank you.